The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. I just wanted to confirm, were you waiting for me to begin? Uh, Yes, I thought you were going to oh, open, open I, I was, introduce me or something. Uh, oh, I, I thought uh, you were going to open the space, but uh, okay, I, 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 I will open the space. Okay, so cool. uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just having a good time sitting here waiting. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, this is I don't know the second, third. Well, I guess I've been I've, I've shown up on the Stoa a number of times. This is the first time in this context, and it's been actually pretty exciting for me to. Uh, reconnect to something I spent quite a number of years um, researching and I guess reflecting on as I went through the journey of being an entrepreneur. Um, I worked with a fellow named uh, Dane who had a foundation that taught entrepreneurial skills and um, one of the core uh, interventions that we ended up offering for that was uh, the opportunity to give people uh, some really deep insights into how their own emotional history was limiting their success as an entrepreneur. And that turned out to be a little bit of a highlight of the program uh, for the time that I was there. And I also did some interesting research on um, the personality characteristics of entrepreneurs. Uh, we had about a hundred people who had applied to be part of the foundation. Now, Peter, do you, are you able to admit people or do I need to keep doing that? You, you'll do it? I'll do it, yeah. Awesome. There's two people there. Um, and, and we did some really interesting research. Uh, whenever I get involved in data analysis, I tend to find uh, odd, odd and interesting ways of approaching stuff. And uh, I came up with an interesting analysis where we had about 100, 100 and 50, uh, I forget the number, is people who were in the training program who took the Hexaco, which is a five-factor personality scale with about 20 subscales. And we also managed to get about 20 graduates of the program who had, actually closer to 30, who had uh, become successes, who had made millions of dollars. Um, and so instead of just looking at their profiles and seeing how they compared to ordinary people, which we just do by looking at normative data for the Hexaco, we actually compared their subscale scores with the, what, with the aspiring entrepreneurs and uh, found that there was actually 10 of the 30 or whatever subscales that really predicted who would become successful. And we'll spend a little bit of time on that, but what's What's interesting about it is that when we look closely at the subscales, there was very clearly emotional components to things. So one of the stuff, one of the, the things about when I talk or teach or uh, do these kinds of inter, these kinds of programs, I really love to have audience participation because it guides me into speaking in ways that are relevant to you guys. So. Uh, in a way that we can, I can see half the screen here. Uh, if I, um, if everyone who can puts on their um, their screen, you know, so that I can just see you. I'm going to go full screen for a second. Um, how many of you are actively involved in being entrepreneurs right now? If you just, you know, put up your hand. Okay, quite a bit. Um, in fact, almost everybody that I can see on my screen. Um, and how many of you have come to the realization, and I'm going to paraphrase this and maybe overemphasize it, that you're your own worst enemy? All right, then you are my target audience. I, I think you're really going to resonate with what I'm talking about. Um, I, I'm going to pull over to my, uh, my Rome notes and uh, just glance and make sure I stay on topic here. Um, one of the things that I think if you know my work, I'm very much interested in transformation and I work within what I call the four facets of transformation, 
which I used to think was a spiritual um, kind of context, but now I really see that it's very much of a personal growth transformation, that there's, from this framework, there are four distinct dimensions that we all have to go through to become really complete and well-rounded human beings. And when I have spent my time as a clinician for the last 20, 25 years, and then as a life coach, I've come to appreciate that there are, I would say, three archetypal paths of transformation in our culture right now. And one of them is the, the explicitly spiritual path, where you go to a monastery or you commit to a deep practice and you make that a major part of your life and it will transform you. The other um, path that I've really come to appreciate and I would say has been a large component of my path uh, because uh, unlike what I thought, I didn't become a priest or a monastic. I, I ended up getting married, which surprised the hell out of me. Um, but that second path is a deeply committed relationship, whether it's a marriage or not, where you use the friction of and the tension between the two of you as cues for transformation. So to me, for people who are really interested in deep transformation on all four facets, not just the first one, but all four facets, a relationship path is probably more intense than a monastic path. Okay, the monastic path is really good for waking up. The relationship path is really good for cleaning up because all your emotional baggage will get activated, you know, in a long-term relationship. And it will help you with the growing up, which is the third facet. And in the process, you will disidentify from a lot of these dimensions, which is the waking up path. It's, it's probably the relationship path is not enough to take you all the way to the enlightenment pinnacle of the waking up piece, but it'll take you a long way in terms of becoming a functional human being. And the fourth dimension, the fourth facet that I work within is the, um, I don't, Ken Wilber talks about it as, as the showing up in the world. And I actually see showing up as a developmental stage. I, I think the fourth facet is actually the um, looking around or what are you sensitive to. So if you're in a relationship and you're oblivious to interpersonal body language or emotions and, and subtle, you know, nonverbal cues, if you're oblivious to that, you're going to have a difficult time having a healthy relationship with your partner or anybody, right? And so the fourth facet is really becoming sensitive to all of the dimensions that we are capable of perceiving as human beings. And if you're into the shamanistic world, that includes exploring the subtle realms, astral travel, lucid dreaming, shamanic journeying, waking up to those other realms, okay? But it also has a very tangible applied thing of just being sensitive to the world around you and picking up all the cues that you can to process them in your relationships and your journey. So we've got the monastic path, we've got the relationship path, and I would say the, uh, yeah, Peter, that's it. It's the, the showing, I, I would not, it's not the integrating up, it's the, um, I call, <laughs> integrating, um, I call it perceptual loci or, or um, you could say showing up to all dimensions, but that's a different way of meaning it than Ken Wilder means it. So we've got the monastic path, we've got the relationship path, and I would say the third archetypal path that's being used for transformation, when you look at people like Tony Robbins and uh, Evan Pagan, is the entrepreneurial path. That, if you notice so many of those um, workshops on entrepreneurial success have deep levels of personal and transformational growth exercises in them. And what we're going to do is look at why that is. And one of the reasons that I like the entrepreneurial path is that as you do this work, and this is what I evidenced as I worked with people at uh, Dane's Foundation, 
people who did their work got past the blocks they needed for a particular stage of the entrepreneurial path that they couldn't make it through. And once they got past the block and they made it past the stage, money started coming in or their networking started increasing and it, it translated into fiscal success fairly quickly because a lot of these people had done a lot of the stages and were just stuck at one place. And once they opened that kind of bottleneck, the whole pipeline started flowing and money started coming in. So like, what an awesome bonus that not only do you get an increased quality of life, but you get like, it, you get it reflected in the success of your business ventures. So I'm going to pause there and just ask for questions on anything that I've said. So I get a sense of how this is resonating and, and what's making sense to you guys. And then we'll move on to what I've pulled up is the five stages of an entrepreneurial movement towards success in starting a business. So why don't some of you uh, ask some questions or, or tell me how this is landing on you? Would you like them to unmute themselves or put in the chat box? Yeah, or? you can unmute yourself. We'll go popcorn style, or if you want to raise your hand, I can get it in the participants list um, and we can go that way, but we'll try popcorn style unless it gets to be too hard to keep up with. Okay. So Anjan has something that chats. It seems like he just wants a clarification question. So there are three paths and four ways up in that. That's his question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the three paths that the monastic, the, uh, the relational and the entrepreneurial, they, they seem to be the archetypes right now in our culture you know, for, for deep transformation and, and where there's lots of resources being devoted to it. I have, um, George, yeah, yeah I if, guess, if you want to just unmute and speak. Uh, okay. I guess what, in regards to the showing up to all dimensions, is that something that you seek out or that's, is that something that you just take on as you, uh, as you experience, uh, different, uh, dimensions? Uh, my experience has been as, as you do, like you can do that path explicitly. Um, and, and I kind of refer to that as the shamanistic path. Uh, but it doesn't, that doesn't necessarily capture the, um, you know, think of an autistic person and their inability to process cues because they just don't see them. So to the extent that you're missing cues, you're going to get friction in your life that's going to wake you up to attending to them. The other thing that seems to happen is as people do enough cleaning up and growing up, their sensitivity naturally increases and their curiosity increases and these other dimensions start just emerging naturally. And that's probably the safest way to do the shamanistic path. You know, especially if you're going to be getting into the lucid dreaming and, uh, you know, the dream, dream yogas and, and all the other worlds that are involved or taking ethnogens and, uh, you know, moving into apparently other realms of existence. Thank you. Andrew, you, you unmuted yourself. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, I think that you... Uh, mentioned this i'm so curious about like the facets of transformation and i was like uh about like your thoughts on autism and having a transformation through relationships and my instant thought was it almost explains steve jobs it almost explains like the kind of pathology um that he has that he has gone through i'm just curious about like if you can elaborate more on on that um, I actually don't know Steve Jobs' life well enough to speak to that, and I'm certainly not going to speak to general transformations of autistic people because I just don't have enough experience okay. with it. Yeah, but but to the extent, I mean, one of the beauty, beautiful things about the brain is the neuroplasticity. We know that if you, you know, people who've had strokes, if they and and in the past could never recover, if they really pay attention and you know, work through it a slow step-by-step -step path for learning the processes that had been lost through the stroke, that they will grow new neural tissue or use other existing tissue 
to start handling that process. And so I've watched, there's actually a great program in Toronto where people are recovering way higher levels of um, um, competence in areas that they had been, that they had lost uh, as a result of this very systematic training program that, that's focused on developing new neurons. How far you can take that, you know, I, I really don't know in terms of autism or what or whatever. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. That was insightful. Thanks. All right. So Douglas, thanks for doing this. Uh, I, I like to hearing these three different ways of doing it. And I, I think these days, a lot of us are having a lot of challenges around uh, the feedback we get from direct market activity. And that um, we're seeing the finances as not a great measure of what we want to create in the world, certainly speaking for myself. And I'm just wondering if you have any insights around how to better be a social entrepreneur or conscious capitalist in this to integrate all three of these together or to, to see some other dimensions of the activity that we do that still provides a, a, a livelihood, but maybe through more social capital or through other forms of capital that, um, that we know are supporting our communities and inevitably our, our, our world, uh, our, our global that, um, ecological systems and so forth. That, that's a great question, Daryl. And, uh, and I would, you know, my, my first response is that uh, we, we, we best see that which we measure. So I pulled out money as a measurement because everyone measures with money. But if, you, if your value system is different and you're going to measure social impact, I mean, and I've done interventions for rehabilitation. And the first thing you have to do is define your outcomes and start measuring them. And then you can get feedback as to whether your interventions or what you're doing is affecting them. So whatever you're interested in, whatever it is you value, you should start measuring and finding ways to assess it and use that as feedback uh, as you move towards your goal. Um, <clears throat> I, I actually have a blog post that I haven't released yet because I haven't released any, but I've got probably three or four uh, pretty in-depth ones written. Um, and I, it's just not time to release them yet where I'm challenging people to, to, to start contemplating the notion of um, um, emotional prosperity, where so much of our lives have been spent on fiscal or financial prosperity, often to buy activities, we think, that will lead to like health and well-being. But most of our deeply, most deeply ingrained feel good experiences are relational. And so if you get rid of the intermediary of money, once I have money, I can do that, or we can go on that trip, or we can experience this thing together, and start looking at emotional prosperity, you can see how you can in many situations go directly to what it is you're valuing without needing to spend lots of money on it. And that means investing in your emotional well-being and your interpersonal relationships to the point where they start generating emotional well-being for you. It's, it's, a, it's an emotional prosperity and capital that I think from a postmodern perspective is what we're actually yearning for as a culture. We just don't have a framework to, to understand that yet. So yeah, I, I, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to close off and move to the next section, but if you want to say something that would yeah, be great. Just agreeing that it's, these other things are more intangible and I look forward to new metrics that are able to better measure our you know, carbon footprint and probably there's a lot better, better things to measure. And I look forward to your blog when it uh, comes out. Sounds like a great point. Thanks. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to come up. I, I, I pulled out a, uh, a blog that someone had written on um, the five critical stages you'll go through as an entrepreneur by Stan uh, Edom. And I, I picked him only because he was the most popular one on the search engine. There's a lot of different ways to cut the stages. Um, I would probably have put them into quadrants and things like that, but this is probably the most accessible. And as we go through the stages, I want you to relate to which stage you're in, which stage you feel like you've completed, and which stages maybe you're stalling at. And we're probably going to get a little bit of discussion in that context. 
And then I'm going to have you guys complete an actual um, entrepreneurial assessment that I put together where you'll focus on the place where you're bottlenecked. And we're going to look for some of the core feelings that emerge. And when I refer to core feelings, that's part of my framework where I, I believe we're genetically, biologically programmed to experience ourselves in relationship to the world and in relationship to other people on these nine core dimensions, which we experience as feelings. So I can feel significant or insignificant to my partner or to the world or to my uh, job or you know to you people. And how I feel will greatly impact on how I show up to the world or how I show up to the relationship. And unfortunately, often the, so there's, that's an example of insignificant. There's helpless, inadequate, potent and powerful versus helpless, adequate versus inadequate, um, lost versus having a vision and a purpose. Depending on the impressions that you have from your childhood or sometimes your early, you know, formative years, if you've got traumas as an adult, you're going to introject some of these core feelings and you're going to overgeneralize them to your situation. So that, you know, and I, maybe I can even ask that, um, have, how many of you people, you know, how many of you out there have realized that you show up to relationships in a certain way and feel a certain way, regardless of who the person is or very often, or you, feel a certain way whenever money comes up, you know, like that you've noticed that there are feelings involved and I've got some hands. Okay. Wonderful. And so what happens with the bioemotive framework is you get a very explicit language for capturing those feeling energies into very obvious um, categories. That, that you can do something with, you can process and start working on more explicitly and more rationally than just being subject to them. It helps you disidentify and you can also clean it out from your system. And this will be clearer to you once you do the assessment, okay? So I'm gonna just go through the five critical stages now. And I guess to finish, once you do the assessment, you're gonna get an email back to you highlighting one of the challenges that you may be having and and um, it's almost like an astrological chart but it's just going to be based on one of your feelings not a uh, but and it's going to be a general thing people who have the burden of helplessness will often experience blah 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 when they're trying to be an entrepreneur people who have the burden of worthlessness will often find it challenging to do the following right so that's what you'll get back and um <laughs> I think Doug is threatening us with this article. Hmm. Playfully. Interesting. I, I don't have time to look at it, but I'm glad it's playfully. Um, so what I want you to do is look at these stages. And uh, I want you to imagine what's involved in doing that stage and how often a feeling comes up when you think of doing that. So the first stage is finding the right business idea. I'll overview the stages first. Developing a business plan, raising your seed funding, getting paying customers, and then becoming a success or a failure. So that's some really broad categories. Now, what does it mean to find the right business idea? You have to be creative, insightful, have focus, you have to have empathy. You know, what do your potential customers want, even if they don't know they want it? And you have to be able to imagine a minimal viable product that you could like start testing out for viability. So when you think of that stage, how many people are at that stage of their entrepreneurial business where they're coming up with an idea? And for those of you who are past it, you know, what was it like, you know, like when I say you've got to be creative, 
and insightful and have empathy. How many people go, oh, awesome, that's me. I can do that. Okay, I'm seeing about 30, 40% of the hands. How many people go, oh shit, that's not what I have to offer. This is really hard for me. <laughs> and, and what's interesting, if you're doing that, I wonder what it is that got you into being an entrepreneur. Because most people get excited by the idea, right? And, and they, 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 they push themselves to learn this thing to bring the idea to fruition. So that's usually not the stumbling block for most people. Um, does anyone want to share what it was like to think about being creative and you know, whether, whether that was easy or challenging and how they got past that particular step? Uh, I'd like to share. Sure, Adam. Um, so I've had uh, a few bursts in the last few years of creative energy, and uh, they they happen like like eighteen months to two years apart. And each time, it's almost like it's too easy. I get really high on the energy, and I and I get really manic. And I'll do something silly, like buy a plane ticket uh, that I didn't need or buy a URL and start the whole like design process. I get really high on the creative process to my own destruction. Okay. And this last time around, my wife really helped me calm down and realize it. And I'm starting to approach everything from a, a less manic state. No, that's beautiful. And that actually shows the potential drawback of the creative process when it can get overwhelming and take control and you basically lose perspective. And luckily your wife helped you keep perspective. And I would say that's a first facet disidentification. You can recognize that energy and not get carried away with it the way you did in the past. And so now you can start using it and channeling it. The other thing that I hear going on is that you're not in control of when those creative bursts happen. And, and that's one of the things about an entrepreneurial world is that many of us are, we, we wait for the creativity and we don't realize that creativity like many other dimensions of being can be cultivated and nurtured and made a little bit more uh, conscious and explicit that you don't have to be subject to the random fluctuations of your creativity, but you can learn to cultivate and nurture it, like find your muse, so to speak. So that's a great example of, you know, the pros and cons of, you know, the first step. And if you don't have the creativity, it's often easy to just drop out of the process right there. And why would you drop out? Because you'd probably feel something like hopelessness. Right. So I'm going to just look at Andrew. He had mentioned that he had trouble with the creativity. Is that a feeling that came up for you on the entrepreneurial journey? Uh, oh, yeah. Hopelessness. Like the hope, hopelessness. Like I, I didn't want to be an entrepreneur, but I like I don't want to like I, I if somebody said, here's the thing, do exactly what you want to do. Um go for it. like that's what I want like but I re and then I'm I'm waking up and realizing that that's not going to happen that I have to do this so that's where I'm like I have to be like responsible for myself and to get business the way I want to do it is going to have to be an entrepreneur interesting and so oh. and to be oh. fair I do I do stand up comedy and I've been doing it for like eight years and that's I don't awesome. want to and I don't want to wait for people to, I don't want, I don't want to go to festivals and, and network and be disauthentic. Dis and I want to like, so there's like a, there's a create, there's stuck being creative in the business sense. Right. Right. And that's where it's easy to get overwhelmed and to feel hopeless especially if you don't have an explicit structure that you can 
feel empowers you to get to where you want to. If you're making it up as opposed to taking advantage of all the people who have been there before you, it's easy to get overwhelmed in those first steps. If you realize that you can hire a guide and help you through those steps because they've gone through it, you can save yourself a lot of pain and suffering. But to do that, you have to have interpersonal skills and sense of self-efficacy and a feeling of potency and believe in yourself and have enough self-worth that you can contact people and put that kind of money on. And you can see how immediately all your emotional issues start getting you know, activated. And this shows up at every stage. So we're going to move on to uh, developing a business plan. And I wish I could read this and see your faces at the same time because, uh, and maybe I can, to really develop a business plan. And this is something where I find a lot of people skip. Um, you have to be systematic and analytical and ideally mathematically inclined so that you can sit down with a spreadsheet and post your potential sales by potential product prices, get a sense of the costs, you know, for the product, the infrastructure costs, the employee costs, the taxes, you know, and it's, it's, it can be pretty overwhelming to do that kind of assessment, especially if you're going to start playing with it as variables to see, well, where are the thresholds by which I need to, you know, charge. So when I talk about doing this kind of analysis for developing a business plan, how many people get excited and how many people find themselves falling away from this part of their journey? How many people, I'm, I'm noticing Nathan is laughing. Do you want to share a little bit here, Nathan, on what, what this means to you? It just incites like a deep panic in me. A deep panic. It. Yeah, it's just like so overwhelming, the idea of like, figuring out this really complicated uh, mathematical, like charting out what's possible, what's gonna happen and taking all these factors into account. And I just like, I'm just like, oh, I just wanna make stuff. <laughs> I don't, I don't wanna do this assessment. <laughs> yeah. And yet if you don't do this, right, you're screwed because I've watched people bring products to the marketplace only to realize that they can't charge enough to make it worth their time. They didn't do the cost estimates, you know, and they put a lot of time and energy into it. You know, I've, I've um, invested in a company called Three Guys Greens and we did spreadsheets and I actually love statistics and mathematics and spreadsheets and programming. So I wrote, you know, variable functions and looking at thresholds and finding optimal things. And we bought the equipment based on that and then found out that they messed up on their estimates of the production of the equipment we bought. And it completely blew our business plan, right? So we had to scramble and actually build our equipment, you know, uh, by scratch almost from in an ad hoc way, not the same quality as they, they delivered to us, but we saved a lot because we understood the process at that time. And we've now brought our production levels back up to what they should have been. But like it almost destroyed our business because those estimates weren't accurate, but it wasn't our fault, right? And, and a lot of people just ignore that piece and hope it goes away or hope they're successful. It's like, well, I'll build a good enough product that it doesn't matter, right? It'll just bring in the money and I don't have to worry about, you know, my, my margins like that. That's usually not true. How, how many people have got that sense that it doesn't matter, I'm just going to build a good enough product that I don't have to worry about margins per se? It could be true. It could be true, but often you have to be very aware of it because as soon as you start getting successful, you have to hire people to do things, to keep up with the volumes and got to make sure that you can afford to do that and still keep you know, price points competitive. Uh, Michael, you wanted to share something? Uh, yeah, um, there's, uh, so I, I have a very mathematical mind. I used to do this kind of work for a company that I built with some other people in California. So I'm very familiar with this dimension. Um, but a trouble that I run into is, at least in my mind and in my, my sort of energetic emotional experience, uh, that kind of thinking is antithetical to the creative process. I can sort of get momentum on one or the other 
but there's a clear trade-off between them on the time scale of days and weeks. So I'm wondering if, like, if you've encountered this, and if so, do you, if you have a way to navigate that. So you're saying that when you're in a creative mode, you can't access the mathematical capacities and vice versa? Uh, it's kind of. It's, it's more like uh, I can, look at, the, I can look, look at the spreadsheets and the planning, and I can see how the math works, and I can see, ah, and then this can appeal to this market and here, and very, very analytic thinking about how the whole thing works. And then if the energy, the sort of emotional tone that I use for that thinking is still in me, when I turn towards how I'm going to um, uh, interact with people or what kind of products I'm going to put together, uh, there's almost, it's almost like there's a functional exploitative way of operating that dominates the frame that's antithetical to the thing that I'm trying to create. But if I get into sort of the, the, the more interpersonal, open, relational dimension of, oh, this is what I want to make. This is what I want to cause in the world. This is what I really care about. I find that it's very hard to, um, it's like the spreadsheets feel like they're adding blades to my gut. It's just not, it doesn't fit. Yeah, so it's, what's beautiful is that you're depicting in one person what I hear in often in separate people, you know, <laughs> that they, they've got one modality or the other, and they can't switch back and forth. And you're lucky you can switch, but they are different parts of our neural substrates. And, and um, they do seem sometimes to be inhibitory. I know when I'm doing a lot of statistical work, it's a really hard for me to sit down and write a report on a client. My, the brain tissues just aren't there. And I've learned that I have to take some time to prime myself to slowly nurture my brain into that world. So I've consciously kind of created some metacognitive programs or instructions for myself that prime my brain into thinking a certain way, right? For me, I can easily move between the creative and the mathematical statistical because I find statistical mathematical stuff extremely creative. So they're very much in the same world. But as soon as I have to deal with writing about interpersonal dynamics and I'm in that brain, it just doesn't work. I have to, what I find is I sit down and I'll just read a report that I've written already in the past and that starts those neurons firing and then I can suddenly move into that world and start writing. Mm -hmm. That's a disidentification process, first facet, that I can name the thing instead of just getting caught in it and moving into a depression or a hopelessness because my mind isn't there. Mm. Thank okay? you. So I'm going to, um, I hope that's helpful. You know, I'm, 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 I'm weaving in a lot of other things besides the emotional stuff, but um, let's move on to raising your seed funding. And this is often challenging. Um, how, how many people are just trying to do it with their own money and time and how many people are actually needing to ask for money, you know? How many people are asking for money? Because if you ask for money, you've got to go to relatives or investors. And I don't see anybody raising their hand for asking for money. Um, does that mean that everybody's fairly independently wealthy and um, just have, have the, the finances to... to pay for everything you need here? I have a conflict on that point. Uh, by trying to do something that could be a, like a tech startup and uh, raise funds in the traditional way, I convinced myself that it would be better to, to develop in open source and trust the community to provide based on the value they see in the product. And this is a core question. I, I'm wondering if I retreated into that because I'm too afraid of asking for money. That's a wonderful question to have. And I think a really important one, because if you're, if you're going to the social commons and the social good and assuming it will turn into fiscal, you know, reimbursement, I think Peter actually went through that stage. Peter, you, you had uh, a quote that you passed on to us a while ago. Do you remember what it was? No, I don't remember. Oh, it was something to the effect of um, 
just because you're producing a high end, like socially responsible program, uh, doesn't mean you'll actually make enough money to to support it. And and but there was a twist in it because the money thing was in the in the earlier part of the phrase. But it it, it caught the same dilemma here that that often uh, the vision that we have for social responsibility doesn't touch the same people and produce the same outcomes as you know uh, an explicitly fiscal reimbursement model some of the open source things make a lot of money and some of them don't and and uh you know you can do that investigation um let's suppose you had to ask for money you get to a point where you have to ask for money how many people would feel fine doing that pitching yourself you know at a what are those dens you know the uh those entrepreneurial kind of one minute pitches like is everybody comfortable standing up in front of somebody and pitching their idea to get enthusiasm and money is that something you can do easily we've got andrew who's pretty comfortable in front of people and i'm not seeing other people saying they're that comfortable and if you're not what are you feeling when you think about having to pitch your idea in front of people it's probably not a positive feeling so does someone want to share what that might be what are you feeling when you think about having to pitch i can I, I can go yeah so like there's a pressure in my chest right here it's almost like something's digging in or pushing in um if i were to tease out some words from that it's just kind of like um feeling of being a burden potentially um beautiful yeah and then and then um making things more difficult for people and stuff like that like there's a bunch of adjacent things going on there so if i approach someone with my idea i'm just going to burden them and and it'll be a nuisance for them and i'll be bothering them right thing and this is on the directly translating the the, the motions this is not really propositional yeah yeah nice nice um sarah's saying i'm feeling on the hook for something uh interesting so if you ask for money you'll owe them something kind of thing which would be i would imagine entrepreneurial success <laughs> um we're gonna move on and i'm gonna just read out some of the other stages so to get paying customers you have to find who has an itch or a pain or a need that you're product scratches relieves fulfills build an email list you know with intriguing and valuable giveaways use facebook and google advertising to hone in on your tribe keep track of analytics and bounce rates and click rates and demographic demographics who is your tribe who's responding cold calls to people you don't know to see if they're interested in this thing you've made for chiropractors or for or you know people doing herbal healing um what's it feel like when i list these things off building an email list you know using facebook and keeping track of analytics and bounce rates to the extent that you have an emotional reaction that isn't positive and enthusiastic you've got a little bit of a feeling belief or a limitation in your system and then the last thing about you're either a success or of a failure i I've, I've been around a lot of entrepreneurs over the last 10 years and i've watched them struggle and fail and struggle again and fail and on the third or the fourth time they make it it's very rare for someone to make it the first time and the the overnight successes that we see have usually been around for 5 to 10 years but you hadn't noticed them because they were failing all the time. So if you fail, what's your emotional response to that? Is it hopelessness and resignation? You know? And if it's not or if it is, what do you do to overcome it? So, what's someone's response to failure? Who's actually tried something and failed? 
and still got up to go again. David, do you want to share what it was like for you? Yeah, I'm actually right in the middle of that. <clears throat> so I was uh, teaching yoga and meditation um, regularly and was going well. And then COVID happened and I switched to um, making it online, you know. Um, and at first that went well and now it's like um, a plateau. No new people are signing up anymore. Mm. And the past weeks were like, Phew, should I stop? <laughs> and I kind of overcame it like yesterday <laughs> when I um, was talking to my wife, just, you know, blabbering and said, yeah, I just have to go back to why I'm doing this. You know, uh, I'm very enthusiastic about meditating every day. I'm just going to go back and share that no matter what happens next. So I'm at that right now. Okay. So when you, when you realized it wasn't going mm. and you know, what was the feeling that you had? Yeah. What, the feeling stuck. There was doubt, you know, who am I to teach meditation? So inadequacy, I guess. And also feeling stuck, you know, hopeless. Like I've been really trying the past months. It's not really going anywhere. But then came the thought, the thought of, yeah, I did not do all these steps that I planned because of this hopelessness. And then I got new energy, like, yeah, I will just try again. Okay, so what you're, you're outlining is, I'm going to turn your mute you because you're, there's a bounce back. He, he just did a great sharing of feeling hopeless and feeling inadequate. And the fact that he could name them gives you some distance from them. And he's in my Nadura group, so I know he's gone through this and, and he's felt this. You don't take your emotions and feelings as seriously when you can name them. It takes a while, but you'll start having them as feelings as opposed to being who you are. And then what he did is we went back to his original vision and re-stimulated his purpose so that it could kind of override and re-enthusiasm you re recreate the enthusiasm he had for why he was doing it. It's easy to lose track of your vision, which gives you the energy and the purpose when you get caught in these other emotions of hopelessness and inadequacy and who am I to do these kinds of things. So we've just overviewed enough of this that I'm going to share in the chat to everybody an assessment that it'll probably take about 10 minutes to do. And it will give you a really personal insight to you and the particular challenges that you have. Um, I'm going to read it through. Let's go through it together, okay? So pop it up on your screen. By completing this form, you have the opportunity to discover which core feeling impressions in your system are causing unconscious distress and possibly creating barriers to your success. Peter, do you like my banner up there? Isn't that sweet? <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Um, when you begin the next session, use the sentence stem that feels most comfortable, such as I feel or sometimes I feel or sometimes a part of me feels. And you want to say it out loud. This process is less about the details and the facts and more about trying to access the feelings hitting away inside you, which nonetheless have great influences over your actions and your sense of who you are. And remember that feelings are not rational. So try not to let your intellect interfere with your experiencing of the feelings. I talk about the triune brain, the intellect, the emotional brain, and the physical brain. They can all process the same reality very differently. We tend to bias the intellect and let it dominate but the emotional brain is actually what's running the show most of the time. It's the thing that we're using our intellectual willpower to overcome. We don't want to keep doing that. We want to tune in and honor the emotional system and process it so that we can work with the feelings directly. Now, processing feelings can be upsetting, especially if you're not used to it. Don't do this if you're feeling fragile, okay? I don't think this is the case for you guys. You can also just distance yourself or stop if you get too deeply triggered. Everything here is confidential. 
it's going to be collected for me and I'm going to continue doing data analysis on it, but um, it, it will never be shared with your names on it. In fact, I, I, that gets stripped off from the data that I do analyzing. So if you put your email address in there, that's the only mandatory thing, and that's so that I can send you the results. Put in your name or an alias, and then just get a sense of, you know, when you see, you know, how much do you see your fears and psychological issues as barriers to your success right now? And just get a sense, like I'm talking about how important is it, but how real is it for you? How aware is it? And, and maybe you don't have many fears and psychological issues, so you don't have to put it high. But if you do, and you can see the impact, just try and get a sense of them. And then how direct, how committed are you to directly find and face those barriers in order to be successful? And this was a really informative set of questions for us to look at who was actually successful in doing this work and becoming you know, successful entrepreneurs. So go on to the next one. I want you to think, I don't have it here. I want you to think of a particular barrier that you're having, okay? And, and it's not rational, but see if you can like articulate it in a sentence, like I'm having a trouble phoning people to get interest or to see if they wanna buy my product or um, I'm having trouble coming up with whatever it is your barrier is. And once you find it, ask yourself, you know, in that context, sometimes a part of me feels very alone. And just rate how much activation you get, right? Maybe the whole entrepreneurial enterprise, you feel very alone and it makes you sad, but it's a sacrifice you're willing to do in order to gain that that success, but you're still sad that you're not going to work every day and meeting with colleagues and other people who don't have the same pressures. Sometimes a part of me feels very inadequate. And just let your body emotional system see how it responds to that situation. I feel inadequate. That means I'm not really prepared to do this. I could if I spent the time but I'm not prepared. Or I feel very insignificant. I don't want to bother people. I don't want to take up their time. They wouldn't notice me anyway. Sometimes a part of me feels very lost or I feel lost when I get to this point. I feel helpless. Zero to 10. Sometimes a part of me feels very worthless or I feel worthless. If you feel worthless, it'll be really hard for you to take anyone's time to ask for resources, to spend the money that you need to get the training that you need to do this. This one, a deep emptiness, it can be loss, but generally if it's been around a long time, it's experienced as an emptiness. And in this context, that's how we've got it. So a feeling of loss that doesn't resolve over time will often become a feeling of emptiness or a hole in your heart where the positive feeling once lived. And see if there's a sense of emptiness. Maybe you lost a partner in this and you've never quite gotten over it you feel abandoned or alone right and there's an emptiness hey doug uh, yeah I, I might have missed you you saying this um do we focus on this question that's surrounded like entrepreneurialism uh or just in general because i'm having different things come up well yeah and so it, i didn't have you write it down but this should be in a, a specific context where you feel a block in your entrepreneurial success where you're, you're definitely challenged right now, and it'll be different for everybody. Okay, this is an old form, and the new ones have a space for placing the context. So you'll just have to remember in your head what this is. This other one, I feel like a bad person. You know, I shouldn't do that. 
um, it wouldn't be right to interrupt the CEO from his day. He's, he's a busy man, and I would be bad to do that. Or it's bad to make money, you know, and there's a block that comes up. Some people have very negative associations to money. Um, a part of me feels very hopeless when this scenario comes up. And then there's a space for any other feelings. The nine core feelings will get them, but there might be interpersonal feelings that you can list here. And then these other ones you can answer or not, they were useful for us. You know, when you wake up in the morning, how often do you feel refreshed, relaxed, and alert? You know, I would put a 10 on that. That's, I, I'm, I assume that everybody felt like that for the longest time, and then I realized they don't. Uh, some people are always at a two or a three, but that makes a big difference on how likely you are to succeed. If you're not waking up with a good pool of physical energy, uh, it's hard to be emotionally successful or emotionally engaged. How relaxed are you most of the time? If it's not at all, you know, uh, it's going to be challenging. And that actually showed up on, um, on our entrepreneurial thing. There's a successful entrepreneurs were not anxious and did not have a lot of fear. Whereas a lot of the uh, aspiring entrepreneurs had a lot of anxiety and fear. And that was something they had to work on. When you're faced with a conflict by, between yourself and another person, do you tend to get angry, sad, fearful, anxious, agitated, tense, or do you kind of move towards calm and peace? Probably too extreme to say complete calm and peace, but most people will move in one of those directions. The more emotional ones are clearer. If it's body agitation and things, you're having emotions and tensions and stuff that you're not aware of the emotional stuff. And, th and that's, that's okay. That's just where you are right now. And hopefully you'll start waking up to the emotional energies. Um, how would you rank yourself in terms of relating to emotions and feelings? Not at all connected is a one and 10 is you, you feel and embrace them completely. Uh, this is actually pretty important uh, for long-term health is how often do you cry? you know, when you need to. If you're crying all the time, that's probably not good. If you're crying when you need to, maybe once a week or once a month, depending on your life, that's probably a good sign. If you haven't cried for years or since you're a young child, it either means you've led a blessed life or you've got a lot of repression. Those will be obstacles to your success. How, what are your feelings about finances right now? And what's your biggest motivation for pursuing the path of an entrepreneur? I want financial freedom. I want to be rich, you know, and not have to work for anyone. So it's more about a postmodern quality of life. A modern, I want to be rich. I want status and recognition. I feel my products and services will benefit the world. I want more time with my family. I want more time to pursue my interests. I want to be able to travel the world while making money or other. And it's really good to know why you're doing this if you haven't thought about it. If this is not easy, um, spend some time with it. And then this is, if you guys are interested, this isn't a commitment, uh, how interested are you in attending a four-hour seminar where we go into detail and depth uh, for 97 US dollars? I can put a seminar together if there's enough interest. And then while you're doing this, did you experience any emotional activation? And this isn't necessarily the context for that. But when you're doing this alone and you're spending time with a, a block with a lot of charge, you might find that this is true. You can use this form more than once. You can keep the link. And then any comments or anything you'd like to share. So once you hit submit, you're going to get a form sent to you. Now, I had said to Peter that we'd go for an hour, hour and a half. This was registered as 60-ish minutes. We're going to probably take another 10 to 20 minutes to, to complete this. I'm going to review some of the feedback that you're going to get, okay? So hit submit and then check your inbox and you're going to get um, some feedback based on the prevalent core emotion that showed up for you in, in, as you did this. 
and what I'm going to do is read my little summaries of those. <clears throat> the people who get them. So just check your inbox and make sure that you get your uh, your email. It's usually just Okay, so what's going to happen now is I'm going to read and we're going to sort of share a little bit. Uh, you, you'll take, take a few minutes now to read the response that you got and uh, see how it resonates for you. Someone's asking if there's particular postures or positions to make it easier to feel the feelings. In general, you want to be as relaxed as you can. Right, so whatever that means. For me, that means in a half lotus with a little bit of support on my lower back. And that's the most relaxing um, position I can be in. For the people who are saying I'm needing more time to resonate with the statements, that's fine. You can do this again. Uh, the, likely one of them will feel more true. And you can just respond to that. If you do it again and something else resonates, then read what that's like. So let me just um, pull that up now. So we're going to look how many people got a, um, a core feeling of inadequacy. If you just put up your hands. Okay, so I'm going to read this out and I want you to share with me what it, how true it feels. Entrepreneurs who carry the burden of inadequacy often feel like they don't have the skills or qualifications to succeed in their vision and are prone to undercharge for their services. They can get stuck at the dreaming stage of being an entrepreneur and never move beyond it. If they get their businesses going, they never feel like they've accomplished enough and tend to overwork themselves to compensate for feeling inadequate, often damaging their personal relationships. So do people relate to that? The people who got that, is, is there any truth there that you'd like to just share a little bit? Um, anything that lands on you as you hear that? Yeah, Andy? I feel a um, inadequacy based on incoherence, meaning not being incoherent with um, the fact that um, my business is kind of zero sum, or excuse me, yeah, zero sum competitive transactional based in some ways, game A kind of thinking. And I would like to move my professional and personal life to more of a game B collaborative space. So um, I think I can shift the business um, with some new heuristics to that. Um, but I'm feeling like the coherence isn't ideal because um, I'm not sure that the uh, service provided is um, when you have the transactional component, um, it complicates things. So, I mean, I, I guess in other words, it kind of, how, how do you uh, suggest that entrepreneurs um, who have um, transactional based businesses or that have to become transactional to some degree to make a living. How do you cohere that with this collaborative structure? Because at some point, do you get more clients? Do you make more money? Yeah. Well, here, here's where I think what you're, there's an inadequacy possibly in your inability to have formed an inadequate vision for this endeavor. So in the three guys greens venture that I mentioned, we're a class B corporation, which means we have social responsibility. And so we give portions of our harvest every week to um, uh, agencies that are supporting the poor and the homeless. And, um, you know, we're, we're contributing to society in that sense. 
in my own bioemotive process where I'm trying to be socially responsible, a lot of my programs are pay what you can. If you go to my monthly subscriptions, you can get into my Nidhira group for as low as $80 and the recommended fee is, is 180 You know, same with the circling. Um, often if you approach us and say, you know, I need some help, we'll work something out. So there is that social responsibility. So we've come up with a vision that we feel marries the transactional with the social. And that took some time to develop. Um, Pat Hargrave has a great book out there called Pay What You Can. And I know um, Vincent Horn's doing that with his, uh, his teaching as well. So it just takes some creativity and ingenuity, but it does take time for your specific situation. Okay. Um, so thanks for the question. I hope that was helpful. I'm thinking instead of um, me going through each of them, does people want to just share any strong feelings that came up? as they went through the program, anything that surprised them. And then I'll either read the, the, you know, the, the blurb or we'll just interact on it in a way that might be helpful. So who had any, some strong or surprising feelings that came up when they went through the core feelings assessment on the particular issue they were trying to work with? How about moderate feelings? <laughs> I have yeah. one. You know what? Uh, I'll let Stephen Stephen talk. Okay, Andrew. Yeah. Yeah, Stephen. Are you going to speak? Okay. Sorry. Someone else speaking. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I had a question. Um, you mentioned loss. Can we distinguish that from lost? Feeling a sense of loss seems different than being lost, a bit of confused or overwhelmed. How would you distinguish the two? Or where's the overlap? Oh, very, very, very different feelings. Um, loss means you once had a positive feeling experience, and it could be anything a sense of significance, connection, and cared for. Um, value were you know worth and then you lost it so if you were the most valuable player on the basketball team and broke your leg you'd feel a huge loss of no longer feeling valued and you might also feel lost because you no longer have a vision that you can enact that brings meaning to your life but they're very separate dimensions if you if you don't have a vision you will be lost so andy is an example of trying to marry two things that seem opposite and he has no vision that can allow him to move forward. So he's lost. He doesn't know how to make sense of his world in a way that he can be constructive. Okay. Um, I guess in my case, it's, it's more the loss. I think I have much greater sense of meaning than I did before with say an earlier successful entrepreneurial venture ventures, but it's a lot more confusing to get those ideas into something that is a you know the right business model just using that or the right target market and all those things it's that yeah but it's more emotional than uh than i you know i when i've talked to you know that my net you know rich network and the you know the startup ecosystem they're they're not help they, I, I don't feel like i can get the right help it's, um, yeah, it's. I, I relate to the feeling lost and not knowing who your target audience is. And one of the reasons, or one of the things I've really come to appreciate for straight entrepreneurial success is the SaaS model, software as a solution, where you go and find somebody who has a huge need and is willing to pay for it, and then you develop a solution. You're guaranteed customers and you can often get startup money to build the, the, the solution. We tend to do it the opposite where we feel passionate about a solution and then we hope to find people who have that problem and convince them that we have a wonderful solution for them. 
I, I, when I first put out my DVDs on the emotional biomotive framework 10 plus years ago, I just assumed it was so wonderful and, and great and resonant that people would, you know, come stomping to my door to buy it. And then I just realized, oh, that's not how it works. Right. And I've worked with entrepreneurs. I've worked, you know, and it turns out the people that seem to meditate or people who have been hanging out mostly with me lately that are, are advanced meditators and people committed to a personal transformational path. Um, I'd love to work with golfers. I haven't found a niche in there yet. I haven't found a way to resonate with them. But as I move towards retirement, I'm probably going to find a way to work with them. But for right now, I'm lost and, and uh, feeling a little inadequate and, and sometimes helpless because the, the routes that I have tried have failed. And I'm just so, you know, it's a dance between what you, who you can serve and who shows up to be served. Right. That's often what, what you end up with until you're successful enough that you get to be a little bit more picky and you have enough people coming that you can, you know, choose your tribe more explicitly. So, so thanks, Stephen. I hope that was helpful. Um, Andrew, did you want to share something or anyone else? But we'll go with Andrew. Oh, I, if somebody has something, I'll just say quick, I was really shocked and not so shocked, but it was like, oh, my core feeling was alone. Like it was, I could, I was in sales. I could sell somebody else's product. And I, there's that feeling like a bad guy part where I quit. But if it's on myself, I don't, it's hard. Like that's definitely a block. It was eye opening because it was like, oh, I have, I failed and I had resentment because I was working with other people. Having that pure confidence on my own is super difficult. I think. Wow. And, and you know, Andrew, even as you're sharing that, I can feel the emotional reality that you've lived through something painful and that it unpacks into even more trauma in a sense where you feel betrayed or something by other people or let down. And literally that kind of emotional energy that's showing up into your entrepreneurial world is hindering your progress. Oh yeah. You know? And so, you know, the bioemotive framework gives you tools, just finding the core feelings, sitting with it, saying, I feel alone, find the interpersonal feelings. Like I feel abandoned or I feel betrayed and cry about it. You'll allow your emotional system to update and meet the reality that your intellect knows to be true but that your emotional system can't access right now and once it does you'll feel a shift and you won't feel the aloneness in the same way and the betrayal and abandonment won't be there and you'll be able to step into new opportunities without that fear and ptsd type encounter and probably learn to trust people and embrace potential partners that are showing up but you unconsciously turn away from because of this issue of being alone and betrayed. Yeah. I'm, so I'm speaking with general er, generality, but I'm seeing some of it resonating. So I'm hoping that you can spend some time processing that on your own. Oh yeah. I'm working with a therapist and that's definitely a, uh, that's definitely themes that are coming in and that's how I'm like, that's how I'm not like breaking out in tears right now, but like, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, way to way to go, Andrew. I admire I admire that you're bringing that to your to your world like that. And uh, yeah. Anyone else want to share some feelings that came up or surprised them, or that you you know had an interesting insight on? I, I wanted to share a feeling. Sure. Um, I'm not sure how coherent <laughs> it becomes when it gets translated to words. Um, well, I'll, I'll pause you there. The whole point of the biomotive framework is Nadura teaches you that it's not easy to put words to these feelings, but there's a process for doing it. And when you do, it feels really good. So if you stumble around, it means you're at a leading edge and it's an important thing. So take your time to find the words and check for the resonance as you speak, you know, follow the energy. The, the feeling that's coming to mind is 
there's a quote by Jiddu Krishnamurthy. Um, it's not a sign of good health to be adjusted to a profoundly sick society. And I have this feeling sometimes when we're like, oh, I hate marketing or, oh, it's so icky. Like, what's wrong with me? I feel in so many ways, it's like, it's really sad that we'll put it onto the person when it's actually <laughs> the systems that we have here. It's like humans are meant to have relationships that are about reciprocity and um, supposed to be close. And it's like, these are artificial, these relationships over distance and these caricatures that base off marketing. And so I wonder if one of the strengths of this work is in learning your personal feelings that you're avoiding and having more consciousness about that, does that allow you to have more independence in recognizing these things about the kind of sickness of the world? Like, I feel like if, um, if I could share one, one example, like when it comes to raising money, it almost feels like it's hard to make comments about Moloch, like the actual act of raising money causes so many of the problems because you feel like you have to promise growth. You feel like you have to say, we're going to be this big. We're going to do all of that. Um, and it's almost like it's hard to talk about that when in, undoubtedly there's all these feelings about rejection and fear. Um, so I'm just curious, like whether that's maybe one of the main benefits of this work is you can actually realize what's externally fucked up. Um, well, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you an answer you probably don't like, um, but if it doesn't fit or give you any insights, then you can just let it go. Part of what I hear um, you is I'm hearing a, I think a bit of a trauma-based bias of a vision for the world. And like right now, we're very much in a modernist developmental stage as a culture. We've grown out of traditional as a mainstay, but there's a lot of people there. And we've certainly gone out of, for the most part, the dominance hierarchies. Ideally, we would all be at the postmodern stage that you're talking about, but that takes time to get there. The modern stage that you're, I think, having a lot of negative associations to has actually brought a lot of um, people out of poverty and improved the standard of living for many, many beings around the world. And you can't, you know, in, until they've got those basic survival needs and dynamics in place it's hard to relate to a lot of these higher order dimensions of the quality of life and relationship even though it was there in the past it didn't have the technological sophistication and and um uh opportunities and and uh perks that we have now in in the modern world so there's there's strengths and weaknesses to each stage but integral theory says that we all have to move through the stages and we just need to try and be as healthy as we can um your feelings about raising money and the fear of rejection um it may be that you haven't found your tribe that you're trying to sell to the wrong people if you look at marketing closely and this is something I admire Tad Hargrave for, he very much pushes point of view marketing, which is really where you share some of your deeper perspectives on how the world works and what's important, and those people come to you. And so marketing becomes a relational dynamic. If you're speaking your truth in a way that honors you and your potential tribe, they will hear you and resonate with you and they will be just as enthusiastic as you are by your project. But if you're pitching your um, idea and vision to the wrong people, the wrong developmental stage or in the wrong context, you're just gonna get discord and friction. So you kind of have to ask yourself why you're in that situation and why you're not looking for a different tribe or set of funders, because I, I know they exist. Like 
we're a class B corporation and there's lots of people who have those values that are also looking to invest money in places where they can make the world a better place. So there's a lot there. And I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm even gonna leave you time to respond because there's so much um, there. But if you wanna just say you know, one or two things, then we'll, we'll move on. And hopefully some of what I've said was helpful. Uh, before you jump in, Anjan, I just want to flag that we have seven minutes uh, and then another session starts and we might get kicked out of this one. Thank I'll you. try to be quick then, Doug. Um, so, so a, a lot of the stuff we talk about at the STOA is this, the world today has got this particular game theory, game A, and it's kind of a downward spiral in so many ways, what Moloch is. And it doesn't need to be that way. If the operating system for society could be different, there's potentially ways to align interests, have an upward spiral, uh, game B. And I think what I'm reacting to is this idea that like all of these engagements does have so many personal feelings, but it's like so much is lost if you're, if you're only gonna focus on the personal feelings and not see the methods of fundraising cause so many misincentives. Like in Silicon Valley, there's a lot of good people, but they do all these weird things because of the way they raise money and things like that. So I'm just trying to, it feels like it would be a loss to just put it onto like personal feelings and not recognize the messed upness of these systems. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll acknowledge that and I'll also say that there is a, a reason why, why they are the way they are. There's very complex factors and systems and we need to learn to surf the waves that are here, not the waves that we want. Uh, otherwise, we won't be able to get anywhere. And uh, you know, one of the things that I've, I've heard recently um, that I really appreciate is if, if people are gonna focus on the, a dysfunctional part of our culture and do a lot of reading and spending time talking about it, and they're not dedicating a part of their life to fixing it, you're probably just hurting yourself. You know, that, that there's a focus that, that we're, um, we're just aggravating ourselves by, like I stopped paying attention to certain types of dysfunction in the government because it became really clear in my mind that, you know, it had been corrupted in many ways. But me just seeing that over and over and over just hurt. I, unless I was willing to spend some time trying to do something and start lobbying and, you know, and I only have so much, power and, and energy and attention, I had to just drop it and go, well, that's just the way it is. And I'm glad other people are looking after that right now. You know, uh, one of the other things that I like about the interpretation of the word Dharma is it means the way things are. And if you, if you want to reduce suffering, you need to like really acknowledge the way things are do what you can to change them, but also realize how big or little of an impact you can have on it. And, and just come to peace with the fact that these are really big systems that will take more than, usually more than one individual's energy to change. They're, they're systemic forces that will take usually decades, not days or years to, to, to grow. And, and once you realize that and make peace with it, you know, life gets, gets a little bit easier and you find ways to be successful in, in ways that honor your values um, and not cause unnecessary suffering for yourself. Thanks for listening to that and I hope it's helpful. And, um, you know, I'm just sharing kind of what, what I've gone through and, and what I resonate with what you're saying. Anyone Thanks else have anything them. before we close here? Sarah, why don't you share something? Um, well, I, I found uh, one poor feeling at first on just one of those video calls, yeah. um, which was uh, inadequate, but then another one came up of bad, which was more like um, it's a, I'm doing coaching and like, oh, what if someone says I've done, I've done it wrong, I've been unethical, and there's no structure to support me in or support a resolution or mediation in that oh it feels awful family stuff terrible wow okay so that's something you'll continue kind of unpacking and working with 
nice. Well, I hope this was helpful. I hope this has given you a whole different approach to understanding some of the blocks you face as entrepreneurs. Uh, my experience is that the more aware we are of our emotional realities and the more conscious we are about processing our feelings and our lived experiences, the easier and happier and more flowing our life becomes. And uh, it also helps a lot with our developmental stages. And uh, the entrepreneurial path that you've chosen is a very powerful path because if you continue it, you will just keep bumping up against your feelings of inadequacy and all the other feelings that you need to work on because they're probably not true, but you've been living with them a long time and uh, they feel true to you, you know? And uh, if you do the work and keep pushing towards your goal, you will be successful, even if it means failing many times, you know, until you find a product that resonates and, and sells. So I wish you all great luck, good luck and, uh, and success and, uh, and, happy processing guys i hope i hope it's good for you uh and can i plug something uh before we sure. head out? um hey, i really want to plug uh, doug's uh practice uh i had a session with his daughter last week and it was really really awesome uh and this like I'm, i kind of geek out about all these psycho uh therapeutic frameworks we're going to have like a psychotherapeutic a psychotherapeutic cafe here at the stoa where we're going to look at stuff like acceptance commitment therapy gestalt focusing and this one is, is, is my favorite right now so highly recommend checking it out and doug i'd love to have you back uh, at the stoa well thanks it's always fun to to do this um peter and i and i really appreciate the vision that you're embodying and bringing forth into the world it's just it's beautiful to see how quickly it's, you're bringing in big names and you know, wonderful experiences for us. So congrats. Thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, there's something, I, if you, do you have like two minutes after this to, to chat? Uh, uh, to yeah, to, I do. Okay, yeah, sure. so I'll send you a different Zoom link. Um, okay. uh, but that being said, Doug, everyone, thanks so much for coming to the show today. Thank you.